I'm Professor Jason Leach. I'm Scotland's National Clinical Director. I was a dentist a long time ago, originally from this institution in Glasgow, and then I trained as an oral surgeon, so I did surgery in this part of the body with broken jaws and cancer and wisdom teeth. And then I had the privilege to go to the States. I did a public health degree when I was there. And then compressing the story very quickly, I came back and worked for the government in Scotland, running safety and quality of the health and social care system, still doing some clinical work, still doing surgery. And then in the last two and a bit years, I have, uh, let me call it, moved to be COVID. And some people in the street in Glasgow would call me the COVID guy. I'm not sure if that's fair, but that's what they would say. And I've done quite a lot of the communication, the, the TV, the radio, and i am still got a day job of trying to help with the quality and safety of the delivery system of the health and social care system for the country. Well, you can't have a fixed strategy in the face of a new global pandemic with a novel virus. You, you have to be agile. You have to be able to change as you learn more. Two, two years ago, we didn't know what this was. It didn't have a name. We didn't know who the virus killed. We didn't think we would get a vaccine. We didn't think we would have therapeutics that would kill the disease. And we didn't know who was at risk. We didn't know if it was elderly or young or heart transplants or diabetics. So, so you have to be able to adapt as you go. And we've been through a number of phases in Scotland, in the UK, and all around the world. Every country has had to adjust. Initially, that was to suppress the virus as low as we could. And we did that, unfortunately, with lockdowns, with keeping people at home, stopping people contacting each other, keeping people uh, away from school and away from large buildings like this. It was horrible, horrible. And the, the harm that causes can't be, you, you can't keep doing it. Now, we did that to buy ourselves time for a various iterations of the strategy when we got vaccine. And we didn't think we would get vaccine within a year, but we did. So we got vaccine at the tail end of 2020 into 2021, and the global scientific community managed remarkably to get us a very effective vaccine quite quickly. So that allows you to change your tactics. That allows you to think, okay, now we can protect people scientifically. We can allow them to go back to the football games. We can let them go back to the theater. We can let them go back to work. So now, two years, three months into the pandemic globally, in Scotland, our tactic, our strategy is to treat this with vaccination, with caution, so individuals still know that you might need to wear face coverings in some places, and to do surveillance. So we still follow the virus very carefully around the country and around the world, and make sure that we are ready for whatever comes next. So we know if there's a new variation, we know if there's something else we might have to do. But in the main, if you go outside today, it feels like the country is beginning to return to normal. But vaccine and therapeutics treatments are the reason we've been able to do that. There's two things really. There's, there's what the vaccine is and then how you deliver it. So when you get a difficult scientific question, you set up a group of boffins to answer the question. And that's what we did. We have in the UK, for all four countries, we have a thing called the Joint Committee on Vaccination. And that's a group of immunologists, ethicists, public health leaders, who for decades have decided what the advice should be about vaccination of measles, of smallpox, of COVID, of flu for the country. And that group of clinicians, not political, not uh, engaged with the drug companies, just entirely independent, and they give the governments of the UK, all four governments of the UK, independent advice about what to do with vaccination. So when the COVID vaccine was developed, they met, and they met repeatedly to say, what does the research say? What, is, what are the trials saying? What's the disease? How good is the vaccine? Who should we give it to? If we only have X number of doses, who should get it first? If we have 5 million doses, who should get it next? And in what order should we do that? So the Joint Committee has given us fantastic advice over the last 18 months. And vaccines are about risk reduction. They're not cures. They're not foolproof. They are about reducing the risk to individuals and to the population of a serious disease that can kill you. So their advice was to start at the end at most risk of death. And that's an awfully blunt way of putting it. And the people most at risk of death of COVID 
are the elderly and those in care homes and those immunosuppressed, those who are more likely to catch the disease and die. And if you only have a few doses of vaccine, that's where you should start. And then as you vaccinate the population, you move down the risks, and that's what we did. So we started in the over 80s and those who were in care homes and with health and social care workers because they were very close to the disease and some of them were dying. And then we worked our way through the population down eventually now to doing children who are the least at risk of this disease. And the population has come forward in huge numbers and we've gradually moved the vaccine program through those age groups. And then as the vaccine wanes or stops working over time, because vaccines don't last forever, basically you go back to the beginning. You start with the elderly again, and we're now on our third and fourth doses for my parents who are 81 and 82, who were the first to be vaccinated in that group, and then coming down the other way to start them again. And we've just done the, the next doses for the over 75s. It's a new disease and a new vaccine, so we don't know how long it lasts. We are monitoring it all the time with data from all over the world, some of the first countries in the world to be uh, vaccinated. We have wonderful data from Chile, wonderful data from Israel, good data from the UK. So we know what's happening to the dimmer switch. And if the over 75s, if their dimmer switch falls, we know we need to boost them. And that's why you get booster doses. So I'm afraid one dose and stop and think it's all over doesn't work scientifically. Now, we don't want to vaccinate people every week. So we have to, we have to think sensibly about what a vaccine program looks like. And that's what we do with flu. If you're, if you're in a risk group for flu, you get vaccinated every winter. And we know that if we vaccinate you every winter, that's gonna turn your flu dimmer switch up high enough for you to be protected. COVID is a work in progress because we, we don't know how long the vaccines will last. We're hopeful that the more doses you get, the longer your dimmer switch will stay high. And that's proving to be true, but vaccines are probably gonna to need topped up at least every year, maybe for the elderly and those most at risk a little bit more often. I think when you're faced in February 2020 with a disease that will potentially overwhelm your National Health Service and kill people, and if you think back to the images of China and the images of Northern Italy with intensive care units that couldn't take patients, with people dying in the corridors in hospitals because there wasn't enough oxygen, then we had to act quickly and we had to act firmly. And that's what the advice from me and others was to the government. And the First Minister and her cabinet made some really difficult choices initially about what we should do to the country. We closed the schools, we closed the theatres and the concert halls. We, we told people not to go to work. That was hard, very hard. And you're right, some communities were more affected by that than others. And that, in the main, follows the inequalities in the country you happen to be in. That could be true in Indonesia, it could be true in Kenya, it could be true in England and Scotland. COVID exposes existing inequalities. It's not that COVID is a worse disease for Polish people or Scottish people. It's because it exposes the inequalities that already exist in your country. So then over time, you have to think about what your policy and your strategy is going to be to mitigate those inequalities. And there are a long list of things that all the governments in the world have done to try and do that. So the furlough scheme in the UK government is, is one example of how, how that worked. The support that the Scottish Government gave financially, the support that the Scottish Government gave to educate children both at home and in key worker schools where my wife taught during the first wave of the pandemic. But we had to adapt as we went through to try and deal with those inequalities that were partly socioeconomic, but also partly health and public health. But initially, the priority was to save lives. What I, what I will say is that nobody should suffer public health harm because of income or inequality. That would be my advice. Now, how that then translates into the government's policies in whatever country you happen to be in is a matter for elected officials, not a matter for advisors. The advisors advise, the politicians decide. So you're right, there were gaps in some of those processes. And from a public health perspective, that's bad. That, that should be 
corrected. But how that's corrected and who's to blame for UK government, Scottish government, all of that, that's a matter for elected officials, not for me. The decisions are made by the First Minister and the Cabinet of the country. That's who makes the decisions, because they are the elected leaders of our nation. And in the UK decisions, not so much our COVID strategy, but let's say the funding strategy, they are made by the UK government, the Prime Minister and his cabinet. Now, the advisors around them are hundreds and thousands of different individuals. There are a few of us who are in the room with them. And then beyond that, there are Public Health Scotland, there is the UK Health, Health uh, Protection Agency. There's a series of kind of circles out from them who engage with communities all the time, who try and hear from voices from the faith and belief sector, from the hospitality sector, from the business owner community, from ethnically diverse groups. And I, I tried to do as much of that as I could during COVID. In the end, the small room advises the first minister what to do and the first minister and her cabinet decide what to do. Now, you might not like that, but that's democracy. That's the, the way to change that level of representation is voting. Now, you do, you do make a good point, though, about who is in the circles. And, and we should include, we have to hear that message from those communities to work out how to do that. People like you and your work will help us get better at doing that. I can just tell you that during COVID, when we couldn't meet in person often, we had lots and lots of online conversations with many disparate communities. You have to remember, we're trying to communicate with five and a half million people here. We're not just communicating with the mosques or just the churches or just the hotel owners. We were trying to communicate with every single element of society. There's never been an emergency like this. So, so if you owned a pub in Scotland or a tea shop in the islands, we were trying to communicate with you. So therefore, inevitably, the communication looks quite blanket. It looks as though we're, we're doing adverts on TV, we're on, we're on the news programmes every night. In behind that, there were stakeholder meetings with, so I spoke to the faith and belief leaders in Scotland nearly every week at, at one point, because they met every week with the Scottish Government. We spoke to Bemis, the group that helps us with some of the ethnic and diverse communication in, in the country. We translated documents. We, engaged with young people who were able to then communicate with their young colleagues because again they're not going to listen to me. Of course we didn't get that right all the time and of course it could be better. Now the, the broader point of your question beyond COVID is should we hear from communities about what communities need, what communities want, what communities can do without us doing anything? Yes, who, who, would, argue, who would argue that we shouldn't be better at that? Communication with community groups is not something that everybody has the skill to be able to do. And COVID, particularly COVID, was difficult to communicate because it was changing all the time. It, the, to, to give the right facts in a way that people could understand them in a way that was true, then that was quite tricky. And we didn't have a huge number of communicators who were, who were able to do that. That's why I was on the TV all the time, because we don't have an army of people with those skills to be able to do that. The fundamental answer to your question is yes, of course, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to engage with every community you could possibly engage with? But it, but it needs some structure and design. You can't do it randomly. It doesn't happen by accident. So, so we have some of that already. We have translated materials. We have NHS Inform that has uh, got available the information that we have around vaccine, around COVID, around getting that information out. So some of that resource is already available and people need to access it or know how to access it. We have networks and you have to put these things into networks because you can't engage with every individual group, but there are too many. We do the same for disability. We do the same for uh, ethnicity. We do the same for disease groups. You have to bring them into something so the government knows wh which group to actually speak to. And we have networks that do that in Public Health Scotland, in National Services Scotland, in the Scottish Government. But you're right, that bottom up has to work to help us because we need them to be able to communicate that message outwards and we need to be able to hear from them. But my, my plea would be that they organize in such a way that we can help. I, I, don't, I don't want to manage it,
but they need to organize in a way that we know who to engage with and who to speak to. So I, I've been on many calls with the Afro-Caribbean community in the last, in the last two years, but I, I don't know who to invite. It's not my job to invite. I go with the information and I share that information as freely and as truthfully as I possibly can. But the community has to gather in such a way that it is organized enough the government knows who to speak to.